So when did you know that you wanted to get into the coaching profession? Well, I, I kind of always knew that if I couldn't play the game of football, which uh, got me a college degree, I met my wife because of football, mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to stay involved with it. And so when I knew I wasn't able to extend my career past college, I, I wanted to coach right away. And I can mm -hmm. remember going up to my position coach, uh, Coach Robinson, Jay Robinson at Towson, and telling him I wanted to get into coaching. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened, um, the head coach, Phil Albert, retired. The defensive coordinator, Gordy Combs, became the head coach. And then my position coach became the offensive coordinator. So it opened up a DV, defensive back job. And I literally went from playing 1992 as a senior to coaching guys that I played with the year before in 1993 as the uh, full-time defensive back coach. So, I mean, there was no great uh, gradually working into it. I was thrown into the fire at a 1AA program like Towson and, and really grateful and forever uh, thankful to Gordy Combs for giving me that opportunity at such an early age. So when you start talking about the spread, spreading people out, getting the ball in space, where did you uh, adopt that philosophy? Well, I think it again goes back to what most people don't understand is spread offenses, whether it was the zone read option with Juice Williams back in the uh, mid 2000s or even the RPO stuff that we did last year with Tua at Alabama. They're all option based principles. It's not blocking a guy and reading him. Mm -hmm. And when you're running your zone read, it's a first level defender. And when you're RPO and it's a second level defender, which are all the same characteristics that kind of follow base option offensive principles and so um, to me it started with coaching at Florida you mm -hmm. know the first time I was kind of uh, thrust into the spread family you know I always say we're, I'm a pro style spread guy because you got about three families of spread offenses the ones that throw it a hundred mm -hmm. times a game the ones that run the quarterback mostly and then you have the ones that are kind of in between and we're, we're kind of the in between because I always want to train the quarterback and, and run a system that can adapt to the pro game because our guy, our job is to, to develop our players to play at the next level. And so we always keep the base principles of being under center some, the mm -hmm. huddle, yeah. verbal cadences to match with some of the gun stuff, the clap, and some of the run game stuff that we do. How are you different before you made got your head coaching job uh, when you spent your time in Maryland till you got that head coach, your first head coaching job? How did you change from that? You know, the, the first head coaching job, and, and one of the things I learned from working with Coach Saban is you don't lose, you learn. And so, you know, I had a rough go at it that first time right. as a head coach, but one of the best things I, I did, and, and this was before I even really knew it, but I quality controlled what happened mm. because I spent about a two or three day period immediately after I, I left New Mexico of writing down what I would have done differently, what things went well, and was able to, to keep a log of it. And I, I can remember, the, and this happened when I became the interim coach at Maryland, and they asked me the question, what's the biggest thing you learned? And, and the number one thing I remember in that, that journal that I had, it said, have fun with it. Because mm -hmm. I really, I worked my whole life. I wanted to be a head coach. And then when I got there the first time, it was like everywhere you turn, you're getting smacked in the face with personnel issues, recruiting, NCAA penalty that we inherited. Mm -hmm. It was just so many things and it just took away from the, the pure fun of coaching and being around the guys and enjoying the moment that you have as a coach with the relationships that come with being with your players. And so I remember in that journal, I said, have fun. If I ever get a chance again, I'm gonna have fun with it. And, and that's kind of been the approach I, I've taken with this next go around here at Maryland. So you've had fun when you were an offensive coordinator. Oh, it was, no that's doubt. when yeah, yeah. you had the right. most fun. You don't have right? as much on your plate. Yeah. You don't have as much on your plate because I'm dealing with the 45 guys on the offensive side of the ball. I, I deal with some discipline, but I, a lot of that, had, the head coach has to handle all that. So you get to have a little more fun as an a, a offensive coordinator or a position coach than I did as a head coach. But what I found um, with this being the second go around is I'm going to make sure I, I have fun with this thing. I mean, life's too short. You know, I lost my son Miko, and one of the things I've learned from it is time is so valuable, man. That you need to just maximize every opportunity you have. Enjoy the moment. Be where your feet are, and don't don't take yourself too serious. That's a Sabinism. Be where your feet. Be are. where your feet are. Hey, <laughs> an amazing guy to, to to have an opportunity to work for. But the best thing that happened to me was that year, 
I actually went as an off the field uh, senior analyst, offensive mm -hmm. analyst, where I work with Lane and, and the rest of the offensive staff, Mario Cristobal and Burton Burns and those guys. But it gave me an opportunity to take a step back and see big picture. Uh, I was able to store, study the organizational structure of how he built his staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, to see why he had senior analysts and why he was able to go get coaches like Steve Sarkeesian to come in like me and be an off the field guy and the wealth of experience that both of us brought to Lane to be able to be a, a, a sounding board per se and also kind of work ahead on upcoming opponents. And it was the genius of Nick Saban to take fired head coaches that may have a little dead money left on their contract mm -hmm. and bring them in on the cheap and and get good work labor from them. So, how do you manage your time? Because you're back here, <laughs> everybody wants a piece of uh, lots. Yeah. How do you how do you manage yeah. that between being the guy that is very accessible right. and that head coach to saying, hey, I got to go coach my team. I got to I've got to do these other things. Uh, I got. I got two people in my life that have to help me manage that, and that's Kia Loxley, and then I got Abir, my administrative assistant, who uh, does a tremendous job. I mean, one of the things that I learned, part of that log mm -hmm. from the first time I was a head coach, was spend my time wisely doing the things it takes to win. And so what I've been doing is when we're doing football, my time is too valuable. I'm, I don't schedule any meetings. If a guy shows up from around the way to mm -hmm. want to see Coach Locks or a former player shows up, usually the former players know they can find me in the staff room, so they peek their head in. But uh, I, I really try to focus my time on doing the things that's going to help me win when we're in those seasons. And there are going to mm -hmm. be times in my schedule now that I'm learning as a head coach where the month of May, you know, we can't be out on the road recruiting. That's where I need to utilize that time to, to reconnect with some of the people that are important uh, to us having success here at Maryland, whether it's the boosters, the former players. Um, with our current players, as always, I'm gonna make time for them no matter what. We got open door policy, uh, but it's tough. It is really tough because, you know, I got a lot of friends and family here in the area, uh, former players that I've coached here with the, being here 11 years. And, you know, from two, 1997 till today, I know just about every kid that's come through this program. So they all feel a connection and I want them to have that, but I also know that the, the goal is to win games and I got to do a better job of making sure I, I'm working on the things that's going to give us a chance to be successful. So after you've got the job, you have to obviously have to put a staff together, but a little challenging because you're still coaching at Alabama. How would you describe the staff you were able to put together? Oh man, I, I feel like I had a home run. You know, one of the things, again, going back to my first opportunity as a head coach, you know, I, I didn't necessarily, I probably rushed when I put that staff together because you, when you take a job, you ought to, you really feel like, hey, I got to get going. Let's hit the ground running. Let's get out recruit. Let's get players. And, and, and you probably make mistakes. Um, this time, I really wanted to take my time. And because I was afforded that opportunity with continuing the coach in the game for Alabama, the dead period and recruiting that took place after the early signing period, it really gave me an opportunity to slow down, mm -hmm. take a step back and make sure I got it right. And uh, boy, do I feel like I hit a home run. You know, I'm, to be able to hire two former head coaches on my staff and Scotty Montgomery, our you know, offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, former head coach at East Carolina, to be able to hire Joker Phillips, mm -hmm. our wide receiver, co-coordinator, been a former head coach at Kentucky. Um, John Hoke on the defensive side of the ball, who's 16, 17 years of coaching in the NFL and 20 years as a college defensive coordinator with unbelievable experience. Uh, John Papuchis, you know, mm -hmm. Pooch has been a coordinator at Nebraska under Bo Pelini, a coordinator at North Carolina. You know, I've been able to really put together a good blend of experience and then bring in some real youthful energy guys uh, like a Corey Robinson, who's a, a big time coach, but also a great recruiter to help put things together and, uh, and put together a really good staff. Yeah, you mentioned recruiting. We're in this beautiful coal field house. It's unbelievable, but you guys got a lot of construction going on a lot of construction. on the campus as far as this program, football program. Tell us a little bit about that and yeah. where it is and exactly right. when you guys will have a chance to move in. Yeah, all that noise is, it, to me, is music to my <laughs> ears. I love hearing it. Um, and when I talked earlier about driving in with a big smile on my face, I drive right past this brand new indoor facility. I drive past the, the new football building that's being uh, built as we speak, literally. <laughs> um, 
unbelievable. The investment that, that administrators, our boosters, our fans, to make an investment like this, 160 to 80 million, whatever it is, dollar investment speaks volumes to the commitment that, that we've made to want to be successful in football and, and get the football program going. What do you want your offense to look like? I mean, you mentioned the pro style spread. Is that right. what you want to continue? Yeah, to we're going. Here? We're going to carry over the things that we I've done. You know, I've always evolved as a coach. I've always studied. You know, we're always going to have pro elements, pro style elements, which to me is three step, five step, seven step passing concepts, a pro style passing attack, but also the spread element of mixing in tempos and spreading the field and formations. Uh, but it always comes down to, for me, and, and, and implementing what I believe in offensively from a philosophy standpoint, that your best players have to touch the ball. Mm. And Scotty and I will work together and he's gonna call the plays, but we're gonna put together plans where we get our best players involved and they leave the game with the, the amount of touches we need for, the, uh, for them to be successful, but that helps us become successful. What about on the defensive side? What do you want this team to be known as? Well, anything for me defensively is about attacking. Um, I, I am not a bend, don't break defensive guy. I, 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 I will look at things, how it affects me offensively. And the big thing for me is you want to make offenses have to play as left-handed as possible. You want to mm -hmm. make them uncomfortable. And so we want to be real sound in our alignments. We'll base out of a three down front, but be very multiple. Um, you know, when people know where you are and when they know what you're lining and how you're lining up, it's easy to attack. So we'll be very multiple in how we align and move. And um, But the big thing is be great tacklers, really disciplined in our techniques, and a, a, a relentless effort team chasing the ball. But we're going to be attacking and aggressive. I don't like the bend, don't break. So you, gotta, you obviously have to coach the kids. How much, when you put a new staff together that hasn't worked together, how much of coaching the coaches is there early in the process. Oh, a ton of it, and that's uh, that's a lot of what us getting together, watching the tape together, you know, we watch everything all together. And, and part of that process is for me to make sure that my philosophies are being heard of how I want things done, uh, whether it's style of play, you know, how we run to the ball on defense, how our offensive players burst after they catch. Um, and coaching the coaches, you know, we're bringing in a system and it's very similar to what, what I did and what I learned at Alabama mm -hmm. that are is so new to uh, uh, many of the staff members. I've got two or three kids or guys on our staff that are young uh, that, that know the Bama process of how mm -hmm. we practice. And so uh, getting that stuff taught, I mean, John Hoke, for instance, he's used to coaching in the NFL where they had 25, 30 players on each side of the ball, if mm -hmm. that, and now he's got three different drills going on at one time that he has to manage, organize for. So I always tell our coaches, we, you gotta be well-rounded. I mean, you know, there's, you look for certain things out of coaches. I mean, you obviously want a guy that has the ability to teach because teaching inspiring, inspires learning. You want a guy that has the ability to evaluate and people misconstrue evaluating with recruiting. Evaluating is knowing what a real player looks like Recruiting is being able to go get that player. The last part is scheme. You know, you got to have some guys on your staff that can scheme. And, you know, mm -hmm. Scotty Montgomery and John Hoke and Joker Phillips and John Papuchas are all guys that have shown their ability to put schemes together and have success. But the real important piece for me, and this is where I really cut my teeth as a coach, mm -hmm. is the mentorship part. These players are. are they're looking to, to you. They want discipline. They look to you to be a leader. They look and see everything that you do, they mimic. And it's like raising children. You got to be careful what you do and what you say around your kids. Well, those five things are what I look for in coaching. And I preach and I'm constantly teaching and talking to these younger guys about understanding. Don't be just good at uh, recruiting. All right, study, and, study the scheme or study the, the, the technique and teaching part. And, and to me, that's how you become a well-rounded coach. How about a recruiting philosophy? What's that going to be? Well, first of all, it's the win in your own yard, you know. Before. Which is a good thing because I hear this 2020, 2021. Very fruitful. Is. But that's been the case around here for a long time. There's a lot of programs that have uh, built their programs off of kids from the DMV area, as, mm -hmm. as we like to call it here. Uh, and so the big thing, first and foremost, 
is to win our recruiting battle right here at home. And, you know, with the, with the advent of, you know, Penn State and Ohio State and even Alabama, mm -hmm. all these programs that come here to recruit our guys, we're going to have to buckle up our bootstraps, uh, buckle up our boots and make sure we do a good job of kind of knowing who's here early, getting, getting them on campus as often and as possible and legally that we can and sell ourselves, sell this beautiful uh, building and these facilities that are happening, sell the great coaching staff that we put together and then put together hopefully a consistent winning program that kids want to come play for. Do you think you'll be able to take advantage of the early signing period that's now in place? Right. Is that something that you guys would want to strive to try to get guys locked in and right. be done it early? I would hope so, um, but we're going to recruit all the way until we can't recruit. I mean, these sign the early signing period and even the late signing period has changed so much in terms of, you know, after the late signing period, we still have that period of grad transfers, mm -hmm. transfer portal guys. So recruiting, just the signing periods are not necessarily the ending of anything. You know, our goal, though, is to go find the best 25 players every year that are going to make us a better team. and and, and be the right kind of people that fit what we want to become and fit the culture that we've uh, put together here to give us a chance to be successful both on and off the field. After spring ball is over, what do you hope that you have in place when you're done with the 15 practices? Yeah, the big thing, and we just talked about it to the team, um, one, is we need to be able to identify who our best players are, who the playmakers are. You know, it's one thing to see them run around in the indoor when we're doing strength and conditioning, but it's another thing to see who the football players are. So we got to identify who the football players are. The next thing is for us is we've got to get our systems and processes in place offensively, defensively, and special teams, the base systems. And I told the coordinators, don't try to get everything in this spring, but let's get the base things that we'll hang our hats on um, as an offense, as a defense, and as a special teams program and get those things taught really well so that our players have a good grasp of that before they leave and, and so that when we come back in the summer we can build on it. And, and then obviously the, the next thing for us is to, to develop the, the, the culture of how we do business, mm -hmm. the standard operating procedures of how we practice the effort in which we practice, the discipline in which we practice, the toughness, whether it's physical or mental, that we have to play with. And uh, if we can come out of spring getting those three things kind of done and, 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 and have a good feeling and a good base about, then we'll, we'll be able to build on it during summer. How about the leadership as you go through the spring? Do you identify them early and you're trying to put people in those positions, maybe upperclassmen right. that are buying into the system? Or do you allow the team to kind of who they're rallying around and who they're following to ultimately become the leaders of the team yeah. when you first get here. No, you know, we're working right now, you know, as we speak to put together a leadership committee. You know, we're going to have a group of guys, 12, 14 guys, however many that we feel uh, are the leaders. And, and we started that process with our winter workouts, our, our winter conditioning program. We started taking notes as coaches as to what guys are standing out, which guys are making the other players around them better by how they do things and how they do business. And so we're formulating opinions. The next phase now is to see on the football field how these guys and who comes out and shows themselves to be the, the standout as, as leaders. And then obviously the summer workouts and then we'll put together a group of about 12, 10, 12, 14 guys that will pretty much become the voice of the team. Those are the guys that we'll work through. And I don't care if they're freshmen, I don't care if they're sophomores or seniors. These will be the voice of our team that I work through, and they become the, the guys that spread the word of how we want to do business. You tell them already they only get 49% of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> if that much. If that much. If that much. Well, Coach, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank really you. looking forward to following That's your great. team and, and as you guys continue to build here. No doubt. I appreciate you spending some time in our new home <laughs> as it's being built.